right, all right, all right, all right. All right, guys, you ready to get in some word today? I tell you what, uh, man, the book of Revelation is alive and rich and just, just, uh, t- just tremendous to me. I-, I have enjoyed every moment of getting back into it. And I say back into it because I've been ministering it for 40 years. I know that's shocking, you know. <laughs> I mean, I can see you. Of course, most of you here know me for 20 years, or a lot of you do. And, uh, you know, you, you, you just, uh, as you study, and especially when you're young in the ministry and, and you're in the 70s and the late, late 60s, early 70s, 80s, 90s, you know, you... You're young and you're virile and full of vim, vigor, and vitality and spizzerinkum and everything else. And, and uh, <laughs> that's a word you hadn't heard in a while, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> spizzerinkum. And, uh, but anyway, that is, um, you, you're full of it and, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, 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 you're, and you're young and you're rebellious and you're kind of drive and you're, you're, you know, you're kicking against everything. And the book of Revelation is a, is a place where a lot of young ministers start and, and you're all captivated by the, the, by the space stuff and by the, all the different uh, meanings and purposes and this twilight looking stuff and all that, and you're just captivated by it. So you start teaching it and you start trying to learn it and you start seeing it. And over a period of 30 or 40 years, the Lord uh, finally matures you enough to be able to do the things that we're doing now because uh, not only do we look back at some of those things that we, you know, I got excited about when I was younger, uh, the Lord has given so much deeper, richer, fuller revelation now of what these things are than, than has ever been before. And my only trouble is how to narrow it down to a reasonable amount of time so that we can move forward and not get locked up on something, and, but still share everything that needs to be shared about the flow so you can see how uh, intricate God is and that he never misses anything. And I think as you've, we've been through, this is now the third letter that we're going through. Remember, the natural outline in, in, the chap, in ver, chapter 1, verse 19 was, all right, John, uh, I'm going to tell you, and then you write it down, and let's present it to the people, uh, three things, the things that you have seen, and chapter 1 is all about what you have seen. What you have seen is you've seen Jesus. You've seen the majesty of Jesus, the greatness of Jesus, the glory of Jesus. So I'm gonna, I want you to write down what you have seen. And what you have seen is a picture of a glorified Christ coming in uh, mastery and splendor and judgment and all of that kind of stuff. Not, not the Jesus of the cross and the Jesus of the cradle, but the Jesus that comes in judgment against a lost world that has spit in his face ridiculed him, mocked him, rejected him, and now stands to get their comeuppance for, what, what, for all of that life like that. So then he says, and then write the things that are. In other words, don't pull any punches. Tell them how things are. And he uses seven churches, letters to seven different churches to show how things are. And, and then he says, and then tell them the things which shall be. So we're still to see the things which shall be, which begin in chapter 4 all the way through the end. As you can tell, most of the book, it concerns what happens on this earth after the church is gone. Once Jesus takes the church out of here, as an example, 31 times in the first three chapters, the word church is used. After chapter 3, the word church is never used again. Which testifies what? Well, it's not here. You know, that's right. He, he, he's not addressing the church anymore. He's addressing what happens after we're gone and just to show us Jesus Christ. Remember, revelation is not the revelation of the Holy Spirit. It's not the revelation of John. It's not the revelation of Acts. It's the revelation, according to verse 1, this is the revelation of Jesus Christ. So what the book reveals and opens up is not the Holy Spirit, it doesn't open up some prophet, it doesn't open up some person, some theology, it opens up Jesus Christ. You say, what's Jesus doing? Uh, How is Jesus interacting? Well, the book of Revelation said, this is the revelation that's about Jesus Christ. 
I'm going to show you Jesus and how Jesus operates from, from now until the end of everything. So that's what the book is about. And we've been so far, we're into chapter two, and we have, this is the third letter we have looked at to the seven churches. And remember, just kind of so you'll kind of stay in the flow, there are four ways to look at these seven letters. I think all four ways are the ways we need to look at them as we hear things from them. First of all, there is a literal application, which simply means that these are seven real churches. And they are seven real churches. History reveals that. Archaeological records show that. That there is a real church at Ephesus. There is a real church at Smyrna. There is a real church at uh, Pergamos. There is a real church at Thyatira. There is a real church of Sardis. There is a real church of Philadelphia. And there is a real church of Laodicea. These are seven actual, literal, real churches. So as we read this, we can see what's happening in those churches, and, and, and we can look at our lives and go, okay, uh, are, the, are any of these things literal in our life? I mean, is any of this stuff things that are happening around us, and is there some word to us about this? Does Jesus want us to know something about our own lives by the literal representation of this? And then there's the practical application, which just simply means even though this is a letter to a real church, it doesn't mean that only that real church needs to hear this. That every church that has ever lived in every generation at every time can have some of this going on in it. Because even though it describes a literal church, we all know that people are people and that, it, that people are going to have problems and issues. And so uh, it, it doesn't mean when it says that this is going on at the church that everybody in that church is like this. It just says this church is dominated by this kind of spirit. This church is, you know, the, the general flow of the leadership is in this kind of way. It doesn't mean that they're not good Christians, solid Christians, Christians that love Jesus and are serving him in spite of the bad place they're in or whatever. So we can look at our, our lives and practically say, is that me? Is Jesus speaking to me? Is that our church? Is, do we need to make some adjustments? Do we need to repent or hear God or change these kind of things? And then there is the prophetic application, which just simply means these seven churches rep represent seven ages of church history. And it's really great because we have history of the church. We have, we have Roman historians, and although they're infidels and atheists and so forth, they don't believe the Word of God like Josephus and, and Edward Gibbon and, and, and historians like this that wrote for the Roman government. They weren't Christians. They didn't love the Lord. They weren't trying to sugarcoat anything. They weren't trying to hide anything. They wrote words about the church, and they said, this is the church, and they gave them perspective. And historically, what, and, and it's amazing how the seven ages of church line up with these mentions and the order that they are mentioned in. And it's really tremendous because this is where a lot of the Word of God out of the Old Testament and the prophets and all that, this is where that comes into play. And, and by the sentences spoken and the words used, you can see what this means, and you can finally understand, oh, that's what Isaiah meant. That's what Zechariah was talking about. That's what, that's what was typified in the temple and Moses. I mean, all of that stuff that seems kind of mysterious in the day it was written in, now it breaks into the glorious light of the truth because the Holy Spirit is un unveiling it to you. He's opening it up so that you can see. The word revelation means to unveil, to open up. So God doesn't want you to stay ignorant. God doesn't want you to not know. This is not the word that is mysterious and trying to cover up something and trying to speak in language you don't understand. This is, these are words that God intends for uh, those who have sound doctrine and teaching and understand the things of God and are led by the Spirit of God can show you and you can open up to the greatness of God and be and respect his majesty and, and be inspired by his consistency and everything in the word of God. And then the fourth application is, practic is individual, which means in every letter he says the phrase, and you who have ears to hear, hear what the Spirit says to you. And he that overcomes, I'm going to do this. 
And that is a word personally to you, literally to you personally. Are you hearing, Jesus is saying, are you hearing what I say? This is a letter to Ephesus. This is a letter to Smyrna. This is a letter to Pergamos. But this is also a letter to you. Are you hearing what I say? Are you going to do what I ask you to do? Are you an overcomer? Are you going to let the Spirit lead you and, and talk to you because you still have a chance? One of these days, the door is going to close and all these things that are described are going to begin to happen and it's going to be too late then. But right now, you still have an opportunity to make a choice and change your direction and repent, turn about face and go in the right direction. And he promises you, if you will do this, certain things in each of these letters that are just tremendous. Uh, every letter that is written, the words that are used there reflect what this church needs to hear, what they're going through, what they, how Jesus needs to present himself. And, and by all that, it's just tremendous. Uh, I mean, the thoroughness of God and the, the awesomeness of God is just tremendously overwhelming once you begin to understand these phrases and these words. They're not just Star Wars pictures to make you get excited about some big battle or something. These are words that are intended to specifically speak to you where you are so that you can hear what the Spirit says to you about your life and what needs to happen in you because I will remind you, we are the church. The church is not this building. The church is you. Everybody say, I am the church. I am the church. Yes, you are the church. If we were meeting in my living room, you would still be the church. If we were meeting in the Colosseum, you would still be the church. God's not talking to this building. God's talking to you, and you are his temple. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit that lives on the inside of you. When you trusted Christ, the Holy Spirit came and dwelled you and now lives on the inside of you. And so you are the temple of God. When we talk about, in, in some of the praise, we talk about, Lord, fill this place. What are we talking about? Lord, fill this sanctuary with smoke. No, Lord, fill this sanctuary with some kind of stardust or some kind of golden sprinkles or some nonsense like happens in churches today, craziness and lunacy. No, you're saying, fill this place. This is the place. This is what God feels. God doesn't feel temples anymore. God feels his Holy Spirit temple, which is you. And so this is personal. These letters are personal to you. And if you'll receive them that way, the Holy Spirit will speak to you about yourself. He will comfort you. He will compel you. He will convict you, and he'll move you forward. So we've already seen Ephesus. What was the problem at Ephesus? Well, they had good doctrine. They had sound doctrine. Great teachers, all the heroes of the early church, you know, uh, 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 Aquila and Priscilla, great Bible teachers, Apollos, the flaming orator, the apostle Paul, Timothy was their pastor. I mean, they, they were taught the right things, but their heart grew cold. So Ephesus was a cold-hearted group of people that had pulled back from the presence of God. And then we come to Smyrna, and Smyrna was a suffering church and a persecuted church, a church that was being hammered by the Roman government, hassled by the Roman government. The huge hand of government tyranny were being pressed on them, so they were broken. They were brokenhearted. They were martyrs. They were beggars on the street. Every time the church tried to do something, the, the heretics of the old Jewish order would call Rome and say, hey, do you know what's happening when this little squaggly bunch down here that belonged to this cult called Jesus people or something like that, do you know what they're doing? They're putting up a sign by the road, up against authority, against regulation. Let's go down there and put the huge hand of government on them, just like it's happening today, by the way. But, but you know, the IRS and all these ABC all these ABC agencies are used by our government to hassle us and harass us to come against the things of Christ, to make it difficult for us to function and work and do all of that kind of stuff. Same kind of thing, except it was extreme. And, and so the church at Smyrna was the persecuted church, the church that was under tyranny and suffering for the name of Jesus. Well, now we come to the church at Pergamos. The church at Pergamos, you might say, who is, who is the church at Pergamos? Well, uh, hopefully this little tiny John of history will not throw you off track, but just so you'll know, this church, this church, this church is a, a church that uh, came about when um, Constantine, the Roman emperor, 
uh, in 312 A.D. Uh, don't shut your eyes, all right? I'll make this brief. In 312 A.D., Constantine, the Roman general, and I wrote it in your notes so that you could have it, um, received a vision in the sky. And this vision in the sky was the vision of a cross. He, he said, okay, I see a picture of a cross in the sky, and I hear in my ears the words, go forth and conquer. So God must be telling me to go forth and conquer. So he sails from Britain, marches his troops over the Alps, and begins to destroy all of the enemies, which for the most part, were Muslim, and there's still a big conflict nowadays about that. But he was doing it in the name of Christ because he believed that that vision in the sky gave him the authority to go in the name of Christ as a Christian and destroy all these infidels out here. Once he did that, then he declared, because he felt like Christ was responsible for his victory, he said, all right, everybody that we conquer is going to be a Christian, so now take this bucket and I'm going to baptize you. And he just starts throwing water out and sprinkling it on people. And now they're baptized in the name of Jesus. And a whole city now has become Christians by the declaration of Constantine, not because the Holy Spirit filled their life and they surrendered. So you know what happened to the church. What started happening to the church? Well, there might be a little, uh, a little tiny church in, a, in some little tiny town where he went over. Well, it's not a Christian church because Christianity hadn't gone there. And they don't know anything about Christ. They don't know anything about the Word of God. They don't know anything. So the guy that was the butcher last week now becomes a pastor by edict. And the servants of the church, the guy that ran the hospital, I mean, anybody who could read, anybody who could write, whoever seemed to be the most intelligent in the town was appointed leader of the church. And so what happens to the church? Well, the church begins to uh, falter and fail because... Uh, they're not being led by anybody who knows God. They've just been put in place by edict of somebody. And, and the church doesn't hear the word. They don't know the word. Sound doctrine begins to fly out the door. And they begin to just, just fall apart. And, and Edward Gibbon, and I wrote this in your notes for you too, Edward Gibbon, who was a Roman historian and an infidel, he did not have any respect for Christ or the church or anything. He wrote this. He said, the history of the church, and he's talking about the Pergamos age from about 325 to about 600. He said, the history of the church, now literally, this, these are his words, read the rise and fall of the Roman Empire. It's in there. He said, the history of the church is the annals of hell. He said, if you want to know about the history of the church during this time, let me just tell you, hell itself couldn't be worse than the church. And what does that mean? Well, on the back of your outline, I wrote down just some thoughts about what that means. And I'm going to just read them to you. You have them right there. But just to let you know, before we read what Jesus has to say, I want, to know, I want you to know who he's talking to. Because when he talks to them, it's going to be pretty rough. But this is what the church being the annals of hell mean. The church became the home of heathendom. Pagan feast days became Christian festivals. Pagan gods became Christian saints. Pagan rituals received new life as Christian rites. And pagan priests and nuns became the ordained servants of the church. In short, paganism was baptized and incorporated into Christianity. And so you look around today, and we're still suffering from those issues even today as paganism replaced Christianity, and we incorporated bizarre beliefs about all kinds of rituals and pagan holidays and pagan festivals and pagan everything into Christianity and somehow baptized it and said, it's okay because now, you know, the church does it, so it's okay to do it. And, and so what happened to the church? It just went down, 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 down. I mean, it just began to suffer and, and, and become nothing because you take away the authority of the Word of God from Christ and the people are in darkness. They, can't, they don't know. They, they, they're blind. They have no idea about the things of God and they just are uh, subjugated to all kinds of heresy and, and, and seduced into idolatry and all kinds of things like that. And the Spirit of God just phew, departs you know, from its church. Ichabod, uh, the glory of God, has departed. Well, it's to this church that Jesus writes this. Let's just look at what he had to say to them. And, the, and, and to the angel, everybody say the pastor. The word angel here means messenger to whoever is the messenger of this church, to deacon so-and-so or pastor so-and-so or elder so-and-so, whoever it might have been, 
Whoever's leading the church, I'm writing you a letter. So to the angel of the church in Pergamos, write, these things says he who has the sharp two-edged sword. You'll recognize that from chapter 1, verse 16. He's had a two-edged sword that proclaimed out of his mouth, so that's him. I know your works, by the way. Jesus says this to every church, all seven churches here, I know your works, which just means I'm paying attention. I see what you're doing. I understand what you're doing. So he says that. He says, I know your works and where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. And you hold fast to my name and did not deny my faith, even in the days in which Anipus was my faithful martyr who was killed among you where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you because you have there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things that are sacrificed to idols and to commit sexual immorality. Thus, you also have those who hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, uh, which I hate. Repent, or else I'm going to come to you quickly, and I'll fight against you, them with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give him some of the hidden manna to eat, and I will give him a white stone, and on the stone a new name written, which no one knows except him who receives it. So there's the word to the church at Pergamos, this uh, backslidden, carnal, worldly church that the, that the national government of Rome has married the church, and, and now the church has become part of the state. So now the church and the state are one big entity, and it goes forward for uh, several hundred years, and, and, and this is what Jesus has to say to them. So this is the church that he's writing to. Now notice what he says, and we'll just get right into it in verse 12. And to the angel, who's writing this? And to the angel of the church at Pergamos, write, these things say he who has the sharp two-edged sword. All right, hang with me on this two-edged sword because this is really a word from God, I believe. What the two-edged sword is, is, you know, and, and, and if you get a picture in your mind of a sword, you're thinking maybe possibly of several types of sword. There are small swords that are carried into battle because they're lightweight, and you can handle them, and they don't wear you out trying to swing this big heavy sword while you're in battle and so forth. So there's the lightweight battle sword. There are fencing swords that are very thin and have sharp points and blah, blah, blah. But this one, he says, is a two-edged sword. A two-edged sword is an executioner's sword. A two-edged sword is that really heavy, heavy sword that when somebody's uh, determined to be um, evil or break the laws or whatever, their heads are put down, and then this executioner has this gigantic heavyweight sword that he comes down and severs the head from the body. That's the two-edged sword. So the picture here is that the church, now get it, the church has something in it. The church has like a cancer that it's not going to be able to live with. It, you can't just treat this cancer and let it stay alive. It's going to have to be uh, extricated. It's going to have to be cut away from the body in order for the body to survive. So the two-edged sword that Jesus says, who's talking to you? The two-edged sword, that's who's talking to you. And what is the two-edged sword? Well, it's the sword, obviously, with two blades, two edges, one blade. Now, follow this. I don't want to confuse you, but it, it, I think this really speaks to us now. He who has ears to hear, listen now what, what God is saying. He is saying to us that one side of the sword, one edge of the sword, remember, it's got two. One of them is the edge that separates us from unbelief. Now, follow me, all right? I'm going to show you this. In the book of Hebrews, I know you've read this before and heard this. In Hebrews chapter 4, the apostle, well, I think it's the apostle Paul. Some people say they don't know who wrote Hebrews and all that. And it really doesn't matter. The Spirit of God wrote Hebrews. But the point is that the writer of Hebrews is saying in the fourth chapter of Hebrews, Hebrews is all about Jesus. Hebrews is saying, you have Moses, you have Abraham, you have the covenant, you have angels in heaven, you have blah, 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 but Jesus is better than all of them. That's what the book of Hebrews is called the better than book. Jesus is better than this, better than that, better than everything. 
And so don't be tempted to go back into worshiping in the temple and, and giving the blood sacrifices and blah, blah, because why should you who've received something greater go back to something lesser? Don't, don't, don't surrender the greatness of Christ for this, for this works kind of deal that you got going on. And so in chapter 4, the, uh, the, the, the writer is telling us, all right, here is the essence of the Christian life. You may look at me and say, Pastor, what is it that is the essence of what we are to be as Christians? Now follow this. The, the, the key, the basic thing that... Christ wants in our life, once we trust him, is for us to be separated from unbelief. All right, you got it? All right. Salvation in its essence, salvation in its most minute form is to be cut off from unbelief. Once you are cut off from unbelief, you become a believer. When you become a believer by faith through Christ, then you are born into the family of God and become a child of God in which the Holy Spirit operates to create you into the image of Jesus. But, but, but the first thing that has to happen is you come into this sanctuary or you are witnessed to by some Christian, the, 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 the gospel of Christ goes forth like a sword and you hear the words, and the Holy Spirit hear, lets you hear the words, and your spirit receives the words, and you say, I need to believe in that, and it's like the gospel sword comes down and shoo, cuts you off from unbelief, and you become a believer. So look at what Ephesians says about that. There remains, therefore, a rest for the people of God. Rest from what? Well, he says, for he who has entered into his rest, and notice it's capital, you have entered into God's rest, uh, uh, has also ceased from his works as God did from his. Now, that sounds confusing, but let me just give it to you in a nutshell. Before Christ came, the only way people could get to heaven was to work their way to heaven. You say, what? Yeah, I mean, you had to make the right sacrifices. You had to give the right blood sacrifices. You had to go to the temple on the right days. You had to give it to the priest. The priest had to offer it. God had to accept it. And then uh, you did everything right. You could be saved. You could go to heaven. Well, once Christ came, now there's a, now there's a different way. And we can enter into rest in other words, we don't have to try to work our way into heaven. We don't have to try to do all the right things because Jesus has done it for us and we can come to him and then we can rest in him. Now, what Hebrews says is when you come to Christ and you become a believer, now you can rest from all of that self-justifying activity that you used to live under because God rested you can rest, so there remains a rest for the people of God. Come on, man, you know, don't try to keep working at it because it's not getting you anywhere. God's given you a rest. Enter into the rest. Now, notice what he says. Let us, therefore, be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Say this with me. I am a spirit. I have a soul. I live in a body. What is this verse saying? This verse saying that the word of God is a sword from the Spirit of God that God uses in our life to separate us from ourself. In other words, I am a spirit. My spirit lives forever. It goes into eternity. It spends time with God. It is what gets saved. My soul is my belief system. My soul is my brain, my personality. You're listening to me with your soul right now. Belief abides in the soul. Unbelief abides in the soul. I make decisions based on my soul. My soul uh, says, this is true, this is not true, blah, blah, blah. Notice what it says here. It says here that the Word of God comes into your life. You hear the Word of God. The Word of God has an intention. The intention is to separate you from unbelief. 
When you hear the word of God, it is intended that your soul would hear the word of God, would surrender to the word of God. You would, you would allow the gospel to separate you from unbelief so that you could come to Christ and be saved. So you, the word of God separates your soul from your spirit and allows your spirit to be saved because your old soul will be an unbeliever. Your old soul will not want to surrender and so forth. But it's the word of God that, that cuts you off. So when Jesus comes to them and says, I'm the sharp two-edged sword, he's saying, look, my intention is on this side of the sword, this blade, let's call it the gospel blade. The gospel blade is intended by the Spirit of God to cut you off from unbelief. So when he says, I'm Jesus and I'm the two-edged sword, that means, look, boom, quit being an unbeliever and let the Word of God change you. Because you remember it's the Word of God. Any of you remember Ephesians chapter 6? In Ephesians chapter 6, Paul says, put on the whole armor of God that you might withstand against the deeds of the devil. And he gives you five de defensive weapons, a helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, you're girded with truth, you got your feet shared with the preparation of the gospel, and you got the shield of faith, five defensive weapons so that Satan can't conquer you. But nobody wins playing defense only. I don't care who you are. You can't win if you never play offense. And so he gives us one offensive weapon. That verse goes on to say, you've got these five defensive weapons. And then he says, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And with it, you're to go forth and you're to, you're to play offense against the devil. How? By your might, by your power, by your dignity, by your brains? No, you're, you fight the enemy with the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, just like Jesus did when he was tempted. You can't see your enemy. You can't hit him upside the head. You can't shoot him. You can't cut him. You, how are you going to fight an enemy you can't see? Well, Jesus said, use the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So the first blade of this sword, now I'm going somewhere with this, so hang on is the gospel, is, it's the gospel edge, all right? But we know that everybody who hears the gospel, everybody who hears the word of God is not going to respond to the word of God. Just like Felix, when the apostle Paul stood before Felix, the Roman governor, you remember this, Acts 24, Felix looked at Paul, the apostle Paul was talking to him about the way, and Felix looks at the Apostle Paul and says, almost you persuade me to be a Christian. In other words, man, you're, you're, you're almost convincing me that I need to surrender, almost. So why don't you go away and when I have a more convenient season, I'll call you back. Well, he never called him back. So the gospel sword went forth to separate Felix from unbelief, but the sword did not separate him because he never surrendered. So he's still an unbeliever as the apostle Paul walks out the door. Same thing with the rich young ruler, another prime example. All three of the gospels give you the story of this rich young man who came to Christ and said, Master, Rabbi, what shall I do that I might inherit eternal life? And Jesus, knowing, the Bible says, knowing that this man's heart loved the things he had, challenged him on that level and said, all right, I'm going to tell you something. Sell everything you got and give the money to the poor people and come follow me. Now, does Jesus say that? You say, what, does it, what do I need to do to be saved? Does he say to every one of us, sell everything you got and give it to the poor? No, no. You know why? Because things are not our idol. That was an idol in this young man's life. Jesus knew that, so Jesus challenged him on the level he was living on and said, all right, uh, here's what you need to do. Sell everything you have and give the money to the poor and then come follow me and you'll have eternal life. And the Bible says that that young man was pierced in his heart. In other words, the gospel sword went forth and pierced between his soul and his spirit, pierced him in the heart, but what happened to him? It says, and he walked away sad because he had much goods. In other words, he, he didn't choose Christ. He, he still held on to his unbelief. So even though the gospel sword did its work, he still made a choice to walk away in unbelief. 
So what does this verse say about Jesus? Jesus says, I'm the sword that comes down on the gospel to separate you from unbelief. But if you will not allow me to separate you from unbelief, I'm going to flip that sword over. And the opposite side is the blade of judgment, which cuts you off from him. So he said this, either you're going to allow the gospel side to cut you off from unbelief, or we're going to flip it over, and I'm going to cut you off from me. That's your choice. You either, you either let the gospel ch change your unbelief, and you live forever with the saints of God, and the glory of God, and the power of God, or I'm going to separate you from me, and you're going to perish with the devil and everybody that belongs to him. I'm the sharp two-edged sword. You have a cancer in your church that's killing you. You have something in you that's destroying you, and I've got to cut it off. There's no living with it. We can't change it. It's too, it's too uh, ferocious. It's too aggressive. We've got to cut it off right now. And that's the one who's speaking to the church. Bob Dylan wrote a song. How many of you remember Bob Dylan? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you old freaky hippies. We all... We all remember Bob Dylan. Could you ever understand what he said? I mean, seriously, they had to put the words on the screen for you to ever understand. Right? I mean, he was just, he was that old folksy blunder, and why, 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 and you go, what did he say? Well, he wrote one great song, at least, and it was called, Everybody's Gonna Serve Somebody, and the words go something like this, Everybody's Gonna Serve Somebody. It may be the Lord, or it may be the devil, but everybody's gonna serve somebody. That's what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying, look, you're either going to let me cut, off, cut you off from the world and you serve me, or I'm going to cut you off from me and you're going to perish with the devil. So it is that picture of Jesus. It is that Jesus that says the following words to this church. And uh, I, I wrote this up here. I mean, I didn't write it. I put it on here so you could see. This carries us forward to Revelation 19. I just want you to see what's going to happen. You say, man, how would that happen? How is he going to cut people off from himself in judgment and blah, blah? Well, in Revelation 19, we're at the end, toward the end, only have 22 chapters, but you're right at the end, and, and this is God coming against the Antichrist, the beast, and all the heathen reprobates that have not allowed him to change their life. But, and this is a forward scene. Believe me, it's far deeper than what I might say, but, but, and we'll get to it. But look at what he says, and the armies in heaven, everybody looks at your neighbor and say, that's us. Hey, that's us, man. You say, where are we? Okay, here we are, the armies of heaven. And the armies of heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Oh, Jesus is going to do something, and we're following him. What's he going to do? Now, out of his mouth goes a sharp two-edged sword that with it he should strike the nations, and he himself will rule them with peace and love. No, and he shall rule them with joy and satisfaction. No, no, we pass that. Peace and love are grace. Joy and, and, and happiness and patience is the gift of God. We're on the judgment side of things now. And he says what? He's going to rule them with a rod of iron, and he himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. I'm just saying the sharp two-edged sword is a sword that cuts both ways. If you don't allow him to cut you off from sin, he's going to cut you off from himself. That's, what, that's the Jesus that's talking to the church. Now, let's see what's right with the church. He says, I know your works. Okay, he says that to everybody. That just basically says, I'm watching you. I got my eyes on you. I know what's happening. I'm not deceived. Somebody didn't come give me a report, and I'm basing it off of hearsay evidence and blah, blah. I know you. I watch you. You're in my sight, and you dwell where Satan's throne is. You say, what is that all about? Let me see if I can put it in a nutshell for you real quick. Basically, how many of you know that Satan's not like God? Do you know this? All right, we think, we think in our crazy little earthly human minds that Satan is like God because we consider Satan the antithesis of God. We, we consider Satan like, okay, God is this superhero and Satan is this superhero, but that's not true at all. Satan is not in God's league. Satan is a created being, just like you're a created being, just like angels are created beings. God was not created. God has always existed, and God created angels. One of them fell, named Lucifer, and became Satan. So this is a created being. This being does not know everything. God knows everything. This being 
cannot be everywhere at one time. God can. This being does not have all the power that he needs. God does. So when you think of the enemy of God, don't think of an equal with God. Think of some little reprobate created being like me and you coming against God in every way. Our God is greater than anything. And so what, what, what is this talking about where Satan's throne is? Well, because Satan can't be everywhere at one time, Satan has to be somewhere. So in other words, right now, Satan is somewhere. He's not everywhere. He's somewhere. Now you say, well, what could this mean that Satan has a throne on this earth and it was the city of Pergamos in that day? Satan had a throne there. He had a seat there. Well, in the book of Daniel, you know that Satan and the enemies of, uh, and the demons hindered Daniel's prayers 21 days of going up into heaven. You know in the book of Job, as an example, that when God and Satan read chapter 1, you'll see this, the easiest day. God looks at the devil and says, where you been, devil? And here's what the devil said. I've been roaming up and down on the earth. On the earth. Well, what'd you see? And he said, I saw somebody, you know, everybody else is pretty wicked, but that guy Job, man, he serves you. And, and God says, yeah, he's a pretty good dude, right? And, and, uh, and devil says, well, I'll tell you why he serves you, because you bless him so much. And then blah, blah, the rest of the book of Job is about what happens after that. I'm just saying to you that Satan has a place to be. And according to this word, his, he has a seat. He has a place in the city of Pergamos. You say, what could that be? Well, in the city of Pergamos, I wrote it in your notes for you so you could have some idea. In the city of Pergamos, there was this giant statue of Zeus. It's 40 feet high. By the way, that statue was torn down and rebuilt in the city of Berlin, East Berlin, Communist Berlin. If you want to see a picture of it, Google East Berlin and look at the statue of Zeus. That statue used to sit right in the middle of the city of Pergamos. And it represented that Zeus was a, was a, was a god to them and, and rivaled Christ for salvation. And there was another god also there. There were two of them, and I can't remember his name. Just say hard name God or something like that. But he was another one. So they had two, two rival gods to the god of salvation in that city. Also in that city, it was the center of emperor worship where they worshiped Caesar as God. And every one of them says, Caesar's Lord, Caesar's Lord. And they burned incense saying, Caesar's Lord, Caesar's Lord, Caesar's Lord. And then on top of that, it was considered to be the headquarters of the world church. Uh, it was called Mystery Babylon religion back then. But all it is is one world religion, one world belief system. And so, with see, see this was the city that was the center of all of that idolatry, demonic activity. I mean, I'm just saying, what better place on the world for Satan to have a throne than in a city like that? So Jesus says, I know that you are trying to serve me in a place where Satan actually sits down on a throne. Is that too wild for you? Do you believe this? This is what the Bible teaches. I'm just telling you, you know, the book of Revelation will tell you later that, that the devil, that Satan sits in the presence of God day and night. Once, once Christ came and gave his heart for us, now the battle is in heaven. And the devil, now seriously, and we'll, you'll see it in the book of Revelation. We'll read this verse just like I'm about to say it to you. The verse says that he stands in the presence of God day and night bringing accusations against you. You say, where's the devil? Well, he can't be five places at one time, so where is he? Well, he's standing in the presence of God right now. I guarantee you he's right now, according to the book of Revelation, standing, looking at God, saying, Look at, look, at, look at Billy Wilkinson. What, what a reprobate. Look at that man. Did you hear what he said? He's not saved. You need to judge him, man. That's not right. I mean, he's accusing you to God. Everything he can think up. He's, he's, he's worse than modern-day media nowadays who tries to find every little tidbit of anything negative and try to make the whole world believe you're some kind of reprobate, bigot, idiot, racist, xenophobe, whatever. I mean... He works for, well, I won't even call him that. Never mind. But anyway, the, 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 you get the picture, right? So that's where he is. So when you say, man, the devil has been giving me fits this week, you don't know what you're talking about. 
Many of you, most of you have never seen the devil. Now, I'm not saying he doesn't have a network of demons that harass you and ridicule you and try to bring up opportunities for you to make wrong choices and sin against God. They can't do anything to you. Look, a demon cannot attack you. The Bible says greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. But a demon can open a door and, offer, and give you an opportunity to curse yourself by making stupid choices. And believe me, they know what you'll choose given the right doors because they know your nature. They study you. They keep notes on you. They, they say, okay, he loves money. Let's see if we can open a door that will make him think he's going to get some money if he'll just walk in this little contrary direction. And then it'll say, okay, you got a choice. Suffering or more money. And most of us will go, whoo, more money, more money, more money. And we, we walk away. We curse ourselves. You, you see what I'm talking about? The devil and his demons are terrorists. They cannot hurt you. They got big mouths, blabbery, blustery. I want to do this. And all you have to do is walk with Christ and they can't touch you. A demon cannot make you do anything. I don't care what Flip Wilson said. The devil didn't make you do it. You did it. You chose. He offered you an opportunity and you made the wrong choice. Choose wisely. Well, anyway, I may be off course. But anyway, what I'm saying to you is that Satan has some place that he dwells, and Jesus said, hey, I know you're sitting right in the center of demonic activity, so brother, I know it's harder than ever for you to do right. So he's telling them what's right. He said, man, even there, you're doing, you know, some of you haven't failed. Some of you haven't fallen off the wagon. Some of you are doing good. And then he says, and you hold fast to my name, that great name that is above every name, that is the name of Jesus. The devil hates the name of Jesus. I'm serious. And so, and so there, he's saying, you're doing good, man, because even in the capital city of the devil, you're still proclaiming the name, and the name is just piercing that evil monster and killing him and delivering people and setting things free. So, hey, that's good. Keep on doing that. And, and you hold fast to my name, and you do not deny my faith, even in the days in which Antipas was my faithful martyr who was killed among you where Satan dwells. Who is Antipas? I don't know. There, there, there's really not enough information. There's not enough written, but I'm just, I put a little speculation in your notes. So given my best guess and, and my best understanding, Antipas was somebody, he might have he might have been the pastor of the church at one time. He might have been a big leader there. He was a spiritual man. But whatever he was, history says or, or, or concludes that he was killed by being boiled in oil in a, uh, in, in, in a statue of a bull uh, picture that, in the middle of an arena where all the citizens of Rome were laughing and going, ah, that demon, and he's boiling in, in oil and fire in the midst of a bronze bull that's set up down there, and, and he's strapped to it or however it might have looked. But whatever it was, I, let me just conclude it to say, what, whoever Antipas was, he was well known, and what happened to him was well known, and everybody was, was encouraged that believed in Christ by his uh, by his stance and the fact that he didn't he didn't deny Christ and he and he didn't bow to Caesar because the only way he could have been killed by capital punishment was for Rome itself to say kill him because Rome was the only one that had the power to say capital punishment. I mean, one of these little cities somewhere couldn't say, "Hey, we're going to kill you." No, you only could do that if Rome said you can kill him. So we know that he was a tremendous example. Everybody knew him. Everybody knew what happened to him. And it was a tremendous testimony for Christ. And so Jesus is saying, you know what's right about you? You're standing strong right where the devil is. In the capital city of the demonic empire of the world, you're still not denying my name. And there are some of you that are so faithful that you won't quit no matter what, just like Antipas did, who was a martyr. Okay, that's what's right about the church. Now look at what's wrong. What's wrong begins in verse 14, but I have a few things against you. Okay, Jesus, that was what was right. Now what's wrong? Because you have there those who hold to the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit sexual immorality. How can I explain to you the story of Balaam and Balak so you'll get it? Tremendous, tremendous story 
out of, the, out of the Old Testament, Numbers 22 through Numbers 25. If you want to read about it, I promise you, you will never watch a movie or see any kind of writing that, will, that is more amazing than what you'll read in Numbers 22, 23, 24, and 25. It's the story of a prophet for hire. When I read this story, you know what I think about? The happiness boys on TV. When I read the story of Balaam, I look at a man who has power with God for whatever reason. I have no idea. I don't know, but he has, he's, he's a prophet somehow. He's one of those that God speaks to and God talks to and, and all of that. But yet his spirit is so weak that he's basically for hire. He, he's like, have power, will travel. Uh, give me some money and I'll give you some stuff from God. Now, he's one of the strangest characters of the Old Testament. He's one of those, I wrote in your notes, he can run with the rabbits and hunt with the hounds. You know, those kind of people, those kind of people that they're running with the hounds until all of a sudden the hounds give out and now they turn around and run with the rabbits. I mean, they can be a chameleon. They can go either direction, whichever way pays the most money. And what this is is a condemnation against those who, have, who, who try to sell the authority of God. They're the people that, that try to profit off of the power of God. One of them's got to have a $54 million jet to fly around the world nowadays. That, there you go. There's Balaam. There's the spirit of Balaam right there. That's, I mean, just so you'll know what I'm talking about. God forgive me if I'm wrong, but I don't think so. Balaam is a power of God for hire. And any of the happiness boys that basically get up and say, let me tell you anything you can, and, and it doesn't work, but let me smile all the way to the bank and millions come in. I mean, we struggle to pay our power bills and stuff like that. They're talking about $54 million jets, the fourth one. I mean, come on. I mean, I'm just trying to show you what Jesus is talking about. He's talking to that spirit right there. That is the spirit that he's saying, I got something against you. You got a bunch of that spirit running around in there. Here's what Balaam did, just so in a nutshell. Balaam, Moab, is a, is, a, is a group of people that the Israelites encountered on their way to the, to the promised land. They had defeated the Amorites and the Hittites and the Hivites and all the termites and every other ite and, and those dreaded cellulites. I mean, he just got all of them all the way, all the way in. And the, and the king of Moab, a guy by the name of Balak, said, hey, we see what's happening to all the enemies of God, so we need to get a prophet to come in here and curse the Israelites and bless us so that the Israelites can't take us. And, and he used a colorful image, and he said, uh, chew us, take their tongue, and lick the grass like an oxen licks the grass and, uh, and pulls it into his mouth. He said, that's how Israel's going to do us. And so we don't want that to happen. So somebody go down there and get Balaam. And he got a bunch of his little rich people up there in, in Moab. And he, sent, he said, go down there and talk to Balaam and tell him, come up here and curse God and we'll give him some money for it. And so they go down and they talk to Balaam. Balaam says, okay, let me go to God and pray tonight. And that night he went and God said to Balaam, do not go down there and curse them. Because I've blessed them, you do not go down there and curse them. I've blessed them and nobody can curse them. And uh, you're going to regret it if you do. And so... Balaam comes out the next morning and says, guys, can't go with you. God said, no. They go back to the king. The king says, bless God, there's got to be. All right, you up more rich people than them. You go down there and you double our price. And so they went down there and they doubled the price. And God, he spoke to God that night. God said, I told you, do not curse them. And so he goes out the next morning and says, guys, sorry, can't do it. Can't go with you. They go back. They tell Balak. Balak says, I'm not taking no for an answer. Even you richer guys, you go down there and say, we're going to give you three times as much or two times as much. And so they go down there and Balaam, you know, by now Balaam's kind of at the point of, okay, eh, sooner or later there's a price, you know. I mean, come on. And uh, I mean, come on, man. I got to have money to fly over the world and be the great gospel light of the kingdom of God. Um, I need this. And, and so he, he talks himself into going. And he, go, and he starts going down there, and on his way comes that famous story that you all remember that this donkey starts talking to him. This is Balaam. This is who, who that story's about. Balaam's riding on his little donkey, and he, and he gets to a rock, and a, and, a, and, a, and a donkey crushes his leg against the rock, and he beats him. Beats him. Come on, you crazy idiot. What? Yeah. He finally gets the donkey moving and right, and then around the next curve, the, the donkey pushes him up against a rock on this side, crushes his foot, and like, you idiot! What? 
And then, and then finally, and to see the donkey is seeing the angel of God about to separate them from each other with a sword. And, the, and Balaam doesn't see it, but the donkey does it. Read the story. I mean, it, I'm telling you, read it. It's unbelievable. And then all of a sudden, they get to this narrow place where there's only one little tiny way through, and the angel is standing above that tiny one, little one place through, and the donkey just hits the ground and lays down with him. And the Balaam's going, get up, you idiot. You know, and, and then all of a sudden, Balaam now sees the, the angel of God with that sword going, just like that, you come through this opening. I'm fixing to separate marrow and bone here, buddy. And, and, so, and so Balaam uh, says, well, God, what do I need to do? He said, well, go on down there, but only say what I tell you to say. So Balaam goes on down there, and then when he gets there, for the fourth time, Balak offers him the kingdom. I mean, silver, gold, women, whatever, all the things you possibly want in Balak goes to God and says, God, what can I do? God, then God said, you better not curse him. So he comes out and he, he doesn't tell Balaam, I can't do it. He just tells Balaam, hey, look, I got a better idea. Because God's already told him, you can't, bless what I, you can't curse what I blessed. So Balak, Balaam does not say to Balak, God won't let me do it. He says to Balaam, hey, I got a better idea. And here's the better idea. These beautiful Moabite women, man, you're talking about luxurious beauty. They tell them to put their lipstick on, paint their face, get all their foo-foo, uh, put on their short skirts and their little halter tops, and let them march around and priss around in front of the Israelites. And the Israelites who've seen nothing but slave women drug across a desert backwards with no makeup and, and, and no beauty and no clothes and no fine look, and, and that's all they've seen for the past 25 years, uh, they'll be so attracted to those beautiful women that they will chase after those women and they'll want to have sex with those women. And then once they have sex with those women, their spirits will be bonded with them. And those Moabite women can take those men away from God because those Moabite women are more committed to their idolatry than the men of God are committed to Jehovah. And, and, and because Israel will sin, God will curse Israel. Because God's not going to bless immorality. So you will force God to curse them himself. And that's exactly what happened. So what is the way of Balaam? The way of Balaam is a spirit that occupies the church that says... Everything has a price. And when it comes to a decision about whether I honor God or I go for the money, eh, let's go for the money. Churches are full of it nowadays. Watch TV. It's all it's about. That's the way of Balaam. Of course, what happened was, was God killed 24,000 of them that went after those women and purged everything and then said, let's get a new numbering. The whole book of Numbers is about everybody 21 years old or, 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 or older died because they sinned against God. Only the 21 and under went into the promised land, and the book of Numbers is, all right, we're going to number them again. You know, we're going to count them. Anyway, that's a long story. Uh, but my point is, you see, this is what God is saying. You know what's wrong? Let me tell you what's wrong. You got a bunch of people that are hirelings. They're not true. They're hirelings of the things of God. And they induced them. They, they trick the people into cursing themselves by, by sacrificing to idols and, and being sexually immoral. Now, number two, thus, you also have those who hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. Now, I just want to point this out so you'll remember. In the first church at Ephesus, they were deeds of the Nicolaitans. Go back and read it. It says you have there those people who performed the deeds of the Nicolaitans. 200 years later, now those deeds are a doctrine. You say, what does that mean, Pastor? Well, it means that if you've got something against God that's happening and you just let it go, it, it, it used to just be a little simple practice. Now it's become the whole belief system. So when you see something like that, it's a cancer. You've got to cut it out. 
You can't live with it. You can't let it go. When you see something going on in your family and in your life and in your kids, you, say, you, you can't let that go. If it's not right, you got to cut it out. Because if you let it go, it's going to become what your kids are. It's not just something they do anymore. It's what they are. That's what happened. The Nicolaitans were people that were led by Deacon Nicholas from Acts 6. He was elected to be a servant of the church. He started a doctrine that said, basically, it doesn't matter what you do once you give your heart to Christ. It's your spirit that goes to heaven. So you, tell me if you've heard any of this teaching like this nowadays. It's everywhere. It doesn't matter. You're, when you get saved, it's your spirit that gets saved. So your spirit is going to go to heaven, but your body can do whatever it wants to because it's not what's saved. And once you name the name of Christ, you can live any way you want to because it doesn't matter because it's only your spirit that's going to heaven. It's a license to sin. It's a license that says to you, don't come out and be separate from the world like the Word of God says. It's do whatever you want to because it's only your spirit you have to work about. Now think about that. That's what this church was full of. This church was full of people that were hirelings and not real shepherds of God and a church full of people that it said it didn't matter how you lived as long as your soul was saved. Is there any wonder why this bunch was in trouble? And he says, that's what, and, and which thing I hate. And so what are you going to do about it? Well, first word, first word, repent. That's always his first word. Have you noticed that? In other words, now, now think about this. At this point, think about this. Even as evil and wicked and ungodly and unspiritual and unchristlike as they were, he still has the door open for them to repent. Now think about that. Think about the love of God, the grace of God, the mercy of God that would allow such immorality, infidelity, uh, indifference to exist and still have enough grace to keep the door open for them to change and to repent. That's our God. He says, repent, okay? What do you need to do first? Repent. Or else I'm going to come to you quickly and fight against you with the sword from my mouth. All right, here's what you do about it. Turn around. Stop going in the wrong direction. Or else I'm going to come and deal with you, not with the gospel side of the blade, but with the judgment side of the blade. Turn around the sword. Turn, don't, turn, uh, turn or burn. Get right or get left. Change your stroke or go up in smoke. <laughs> and now, this is one of the most interesting parts, and I'm going to do it just quickly. There are three things that are said at the end. This is always one of the most, to me, amazing things, is how, what he says to them at the end. And it's always based on what they need to hear based on what's going on in their life. Now, let me just show you what I mean here. This, he says, all right, repent, or I'm going to come quickly. The very next verse, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. All right, what are you saying to us, Jesus? He says, all right, I'm going to say this to you. If you will allow the gospel side of the sword to separate you from unbelief, you will become victorious. How do you become an overcomer? By surrendering to Christ. So he says, if you'll overcome, if you'll become an overcomer by coming to the cross, turning away from unbelief, trusting Christ, then this is what I'm going to give you. And, 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 and this is... This is why this is so important. What, the, there were three things in Pergamos that were going on. Now, this is just a summary of the three things. This was caused by the doctrine of Balaam. This was caused by uh, uh, the teachings of the Nicolaitans. This was uh, uh, because of the carnality of the church. There are three things that were going on that Jesus hated. Look at the three. I wrote them up here. Idolatry was one thing he hated. Always has, always will. You say, I don't have any little idols in my yard. I know you don't. But you worship something besides Jesus as an idol. Your money, your prestige, your pride, your children, whatever it might be. If you worship it, it's an idol. Idolatry, immorality, which includes worshiping false things and serving uh, misdirections and blah, blah. You, and then third is infidelity being unfaithful to the name of Christ, 
committing adultery. Not, I'm not talking about you have sex with somebody. I'm talking about spiritual adultery. I'm talking about, I'm talking about Jesus, you married Jesus, and now you, you know, you're dancing with the devil, so you have committed spiritual adultery against the Spirit of God. And so that's what was going on. Now notice what he says. To him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna to eat. Now, idolatry was marked in that day by eating things that were sacrificed to idols. So, what does he say to someone who has been eating things sacrificed to idols? He said, you know what the world tells you? The world tells you we got to have a big banquet and we got to put on a big show and I'm going to have this big showy uh, act that I'm providing for you and that I've meeting all your needs. And all it is is a big show. It's, it, it, it's, it's carnal. It, it, it goes away. As soon as the movie cameras turn off, then the stuff goes away. But he said, opposite of that, here's what I'm saying to you. If you'll come to the cross and let me save your soul... I'll give you hidden manna. What is manna? Manna is angel's food. You remember manna is what fell out of heaven to feed Israel when they were on the desert. Where did it come from? I don't know, angels. Where did it go to? I don't know, angels. Have any of you ever seen it? No, but they said it existed. Moses took some of it and put it in the Ark of the Covenant. You know, of course, it was just shriveled up mess of nothing, but it represented the manna that fell from heaven. And so what is Jesus saying? Jesus is saying, listen, if you'll give yourself to me in those desperate times of life, in those hidden secrets of life, when you're most de desperate in the darkness, away from the glare of the crowd, no TV cameras going, and you need some real sustaining life, I'm going to give you manna that's hidden. And you'll have everything you need in the desperate moments of life when nobody's looking but you. Let me change you, he says. I'll give you that hidden manna that nobody knows about. Man, that stuff you desperately need in your hour of need. And then he said, I'm going to give you a white stone. A white stone. Of course, you recognize white is a symbol for purity. Now, immorality, they become immoral. You know, they're, they're giving themselves away. They're being seduced by spirits and so forth, Jesus says, you know what I'll do? If you'll surrender, I'll make you clean again. But now it's a little more interesting than just getting a white stone, and white meaning purity, even though that's what the stone means. Let me just tell you this. In the breastplate of the high priest of Israel, there were 12 stones, one for each of the tribes of Israel. There, those stones had a name written on it, the name of the tribe, Simeon, Judah, Benjamin, Ephraim, Dan, Issachar, Zebulun, Asher, Manasseh, Gad, and Reuben. Everybody had a stone so that when God called forth, the high priest could use that, those stones as to which one God was talking to. Also on the stone, on the high priest's uh, garment were two stones, a white stone and a black stone. The white stone was called Urim and the black stone was called Thummim. How many of you have ever heard the term blackballed? You heard that? That's where it came from. When, God, when, they, when the priest needed to know from God, God, do we go this direction? And then God would speak to him by allowing him to choose a stone, and then he would open his eyes, and if it was black, that meant don't go. If it was white, it meant go. So if you've ever been blackballed, it means you got the thummim and not the urim. God says, I'll give you a white stone. I won't blackball you. you would come to Christ, even though you've been immoral, you, you committed adultery, you're a sinner, reprobate, outlaw. I'm going to give you a stone of acceptance. You won't be blackballed out of the kingdom of God. What a good word from the Spirit of God. And then the third problem they had was infidelity. You know what infidelity is? Betraying the name. If, if, if Tanya sinned against me, it would be she would be sinning against my name. Sinning against the greatness, the goodness of the name. She would be no more worthy of the name. So what Jesus says to somebody like that is, he said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to give you a new name that nobody knows but you and me. So if you'll allow me to change you 
Here's what I'm going to do for you. I'm going to take care of you in the desperate time when you need to be fed that nobody knows it. I'm going to give you the white stone so that you can come in with the kingdom of God. And I'm going to give you a new name. Just like on the stones on the breastplate of the high priest where every name of every tribe was written, on your stone is going to be written a new name. It used to be idolater, liar, uh, riffraff, cheater, sinner, rebellious, whatever. Now there's a brand new name, saved, sanctified, holy, righteous, great, mercy, that only you'll get to see and only you and God know. What a tremendous problem. I mean, is the Spirit of God saying anything to you about your life? Huh? Does that speak anything to you? This is to a church that was married to the world. And became everything that the world could push it toward. It kind of reminds you of today, doesn't it? Are we seeing anything like this? My Lord, just open the newspaper. Well, no, we don't even read newspapers anymore. You know, pop on Google or pull up your Facebook or whatever. And look at what things are happening in this world. To this world, Jesus is saying the same thing. All right.